Well, good morning. We'll take a little time here, and we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Before we do that, I want to read from uh, Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 13. This is the Lord's Prayer. Now Jesus was teaching in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, which of you has a friend? will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet he, because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, Father, hallowed be your name. We praise you, God, because you are holy and set apart. And Lord, we thank you that we live in a nation that we have such abundance that we do not have to search for food. We have full bellies here. And Lord, you provide far more than the rest of the world has mostly. Lord, our nation, we're so thankful for spring as the warm weather comes, and we thank you, Lord, for those warm temperatures as it just fills our hearts with joy. But Lord, we do know that with spring comes flooding, and we pray for those who are affected by flooding right now in parts of our nation that uh, are small towns that don't receive much, much news. We pray for your love and grace and kindness to them as they go through this trying time, and that your support would be their foundation. Lord, we also thank you that Emmanuel and Laura and Joseph are finally together again and that uh, you've brought them on this long journey. And Lord, as you give them rest, we ask that they would have renewed spirits and that uh, as they look forward to serving you again, you would provide all that they need and that would truly be an act of God for the work that they are able to do in Nigeria. Lord, I pray for our nation's leaders, that we would all turn and follow you, that you would give them guidance and wisdom, and Lord, as our nation's heart seems to have turned away from you, I pray that you would bring it back, and that we would humble ourselves before you, Lord Jesus, and follow after Christ. Specifically, Lord, we pray again for Steve and Gail as they go through this trying time. We praise you, Lord, for your healing hand. As we've heard that Gail's made some more improvements this week and seems to be more and more improvements. We praise you, Lord, as you are the healer who can heal as no other doctor or physician can. We pray, Lord, also for Steve as he must try these waters. We ask, Lord, for the finances as it's just a difference in in the world and the way that they've used to live. And we pray for them that your spirit would not leave them and that your grace would fill their hearts. Lord, we pray for our servicemen and women, specifically Jordan, and for his wife, Carissa, as he goes on deployment, Lord, that you would watch over him and watch over our nation's servicemen and women, that you would protect them. We ask for your grace and kindness for all those who have to leave their families and for strength as they have to be apart. We love you, Lord Jesus. We praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. So this morning, I'll be reading from James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. 
Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers. James 3, 1 to 12. James 3, 1 to 12. (laughs) Read it off the page. Funny they picked me to read these verses today, too. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. At this time, children aged four to six are dismissed for the children's lesson. Thanks, Dominic. Uh, one little announcement for you, just, you, you probably know this already, I mean, coming uh, right around the corner is Good Friday and Easter, and uh, there'll be some postcards that are sent out, but there are copies of these um, just at, on both of the tables in the back and on the Connection Center that uh, we've printed off extras for you, uh, just as a means of, of encouraging you to be thinking about that, praying for neighbors or family members that will be in town, but also for you, it's an easy thing to put into the hand of someone that you've been praying for or a neighbor and just encourage them to be here. Uh, Good Friday, we will look at the cup. So Jesus prays, Father, that this cup may pass from me. What's he talking about there? And then on Easter Sunday, looking at hope and how Christ's victory over death secures our victory day by day and gives us hope. And so I'd encourage you to be thinking about that, praying to that end, and if there are people that you want to pursue and invite um, that's an easy way for you to, to do that. But one of the things about me that you may not know, well, I don't know why you'd know this at this point, but I, I'm not a big fan of doctors at all. Like, I don't like going to the doctor, uh, sometimes even walking into the hospital for like hospital visits. I'm like, is my knee now all of a sudden starting to hurt or my, my back? Like, there's something about walking in there that just escalates things for me uh, that I just, don't, I just do not like going Years ago, we were in Louisiana visiting my, my parents, and I don't remember if it was Christmas time or something, but I remember just not feeling good. And so finally, I went to uh, an urgent care, and uh, they ran a couple of tests, and she said, well, the good news is you have strep, and you have a sinus infection, and you have bronchitis. So at least you got all these at the same time. And she said, we can run all the full-blown tests to confirm that, but it looks like this is what, what's happening. This is what you, you have. And I said, well, no, no sense in paying you more money for something you've already told me, right? These rapid tests work. These rapid tests show you pretty quickly what the issue is. No sense in going through more of these gag reflex-inducing commands, like, like let's press down your tongue, let's look at your tongue, let's look at your, your body more, right? Nowadays, you can go on WebMD and type in, none of you do this, I'm sure, like you go on WebMD type in uh, all of your symptoms and it prints off the list of here's, here's everything that's wrong. <laughs> then you run to Walgreens or to the pharmacy and 
uh, have all these things that you should do. I'm sure none of you do that. But if you were to type in, I did that this week. Like typed in like six different things, like inflamed tongue, hurting tongue, swollen tongue. My tongue feels like it's on fire. Right? And it says we have B12 deficiency. <laughs> and, and James is saying that you don't have B12 deficiency. You have a heart problem. Right? And this is, again, flowing from everything we've seen, that the, the, the root in your life, your heart displays itself in, in many, many ways. And, and one of the most prominent for us is our tongue. So if you were to look at our culture and type in some of these symptoms that we see, I mean, it, would, it would point to that, that indicator as well, this diagnosis as well. But there are some modern cultural symptoms in tongue management, if that's what you want to call it. Right Nowadays, it's the, the modern mantra is just speak your mind. If you feel like you want to say something, especially with social media, just say it. Or if on social media you have a, person, a persona or per personality that, that you feel like you can say whatever you want because in, in normal circles and normal conversations, you never operate that way. But just speak your mind. We see this from top down in leadership, right? Belittle others, berate others. And one of the biggest things I think in our culture today is to demonize those you disagree with, right? So you sit, it used to be that you'd sit across a table from someone and vehemently disagree with their view, and you attack the view. Like, I don't, I don't see how you can believe this or understand this or hold to this. And now, forget about the view. Now we just demonize the other person, and we attack the other person. There was an article released recently from, from someone. I don't know if they have kids, but lying is good. Lying is good for your kids' social development. Like, you must not have kids at all. Right, So it's good for your kids to learn lying. It's good for them in their developmental process. So let them lie. Like I said, one of the, the quickest ways for us to know what's going on in our hearts and our lives is just to open your mouth. And, and James in verses 1 to 12 is saying that. The quickest way to display the, the true state of our faith and at the same time our greatest need is by opening our mouths. Last week we saw that authentic faith will always produce accompanying fruit. Always. And here, James goes really, really practical, really, really quick and says, let's test this. Open your mouth. This kind of is rooted back, and now James will begin to kind of repeat some of the things that he's brought up, especially in the opening chapter, but Verse 26 of chapter 1, if anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, that person's religion is worthless. So let's look this morning at this text. Verses 1 to 5, our tongues reveal our inadequacies. So in many ways, this shows the reality for us that we're not there yet. So James begins with, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Interesting to know the first sermon I ever preached, December 29th, 2008, was on this text. And there, there's something, I said that then in that sermon, I'll, I'll say it now, but there, there's a weight to uh, holding up God's word, opening God's word, dissecting God's word, looking at it, preaching, teaching Applying God's word to the lives of others, it brings a certain urgency and a weight and responsibility that, uh, that still to this day, and I, I don't know that I ever want to move beyond that reality and that, that sense of sobriety with approaching God's word and preaching to, to you or to anyone. Months before I graduated college, my professor asked me, my, my advisor asked, so James, what are you, you going to do? Your gra I mean, graduation's right around the corner. You're graduating with a degree in ministry. What do you want to do? And I said, anything other than students and preaching. <laughs> That's funny. I spent 12 years as a youth pastor, family pastor, and now preach every week. Because there's a, there's a weight and a reality to opening up God's word because of this judgment that's there. Again, the, the, we, we must approach with some sobriety. 
And James moves from that into uh, to, to everyone. So we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone doesn't stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, also able to bridle his whole body. So stumble here is just another way of saying sin. We all sin in many ways. This is present tense, ongoing, continuous. This is the pattern of our lives, that we continue to sin and stumble day by day, moment by moment. And he's saying, if, if you don't, you're, you're perfect. And he's saying, one of the quickest ways to show that you're not perfect is by opening our mouths. Because he's saying, this is, uh, if you're not stumbling in what you say, you are perfect. Again, this is that word that he's used over and over already. This is complete. It's lacking in nothing. Right? This is the goal, the, the destination. Right? So he's saying if you're not stumbling, especially in what you say, you are perfect. You've arrived. You're complete. You're, you're there. Right? And the reality is we're, we're not. I don't know about you, but my tongue reminds me of this daily. I'm not there yet. God's working in me of sanctification isn't complete yet. This is a great reminder for us that, that there's, still, there's still steps to be taken and a journey before us, holiness to pursue. We've not arrived. Last Monday, I don't know if you saw this in the news, a British Airways flight from London, everybody gets on board, checks their tickets, stows their luggage, plane takes off, a couple hours later they land it was probably not a couple hours. Short time later, they land, say, all right, we're, we're here in Edinburgh. So uh, baggage can be collected at, at this concourse. Everybody on the plane is going, Edinburgh? We're supposed to be in Dusseldorf. Right? And the flight plan said Edinburgh, but everybody on board was supposed to be going to Germany. So they figured out what to do and told everybody to buckle up and get back on our journey. We're not there yet. And James is saying the same thing. It, we all stumble. We all sin over and over daily. This is the process and the reality of our lives. And if you do not stumble in what you say, you've arrived. You are perfect. And knowing that we're not perfect and we've not arrived, this is the reality of that the, we still have this process before us. Sinclair Ferguson says, One of, or Our use of the tongue is a sure evidence of the condition of our heart. It's the hinge on which the doors into our soul swing open in order to reveal our spirits. So many of you open your mouth. Right? We can dress up, shave, put on deodorant, and dress up nice and come in and right, drive a nice car and paint the house. Like from the outside, everything looks good. And the minute you open your mouth, right, it's just it's just shot. So James says, in some really profound imagery here, what the real problem is, right? So you can take a bit, an eight-ounce steel bit, and put it into the mouth of a 600-pound animal, and you can put a, a 10-year-old on top of that animal and control that, that with just this small piece of metal in the horse's mouth. My brother was on the, the USS Enterprise for a number of years, that's, that's a Navy, by the way, not Star Trek. <laughs> right? The Enterprise weighs 95,000 tons. I don't know how much that is in pounds. Math, math guys can run that. 95,000 tons. It's controlled by four 35-foot rudders. Your tongue, not just this little piece of flesh that you see, but all of your tongue weighs two pounds. And I'm not going to guess your weight, uh, I don't want to offend anyone. So I, I weigh 200-ish pounds. I'll suck that in. 200 pounds. My life is controlled. My body is controlled by a two-pound piece of flesh inside of my mouth. And James's contrast here is not simply to say, look how small it is, look how insignificant it is, or the disproportion between the bit and the horse or the rudder and the ship. What he's saying is that we cannot control our tongue. It is the tongue here that controls us. It seems almost to have a mind of its own. Look at the ships. Verse 4. Though they're so large, they're driven by strong winds. They're guided by a very small rudder where the will of the pilot directs. 
so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. So the, 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 the bit controls the horse, the rudder controls the ship, and your tongue controls you because we're not there yet. And one of the implications of this for us, the, the outworking of this for us is humility. We're not there yet. Again, I don't know about you. I, I know for me, I'm not there yet. And that it has to bring a certain level of humility into my life as God continues to work, reminding me that, James, you're not there yet. You've not arrived. You are not perfect and complete, lacking in nothing, especially as we saw early on. You are still a work in progress, and you are amidst good company. So, humility. The second thing we see is that our tongues reveal our own inabilities. So this is a report. You go to the doctor, and they say, hey, here's the diagnosis for you. Here's the report. James is saying, you need help. We need help. Verses, second half of verse 5 through verse 8. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird or reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. So James uses some vivid imagery and some stark application here for us, basically saying the tongue takes evil ideas that originate with Satan, right, set on fire by hell, the staining wickedness of the world. So same uh, language that he uses here for staining the whole body, right? At the end of chapter one, he says, the goal of your life if you want to live religiously is to visit orphans and widows and keep yourself unstained from the world. So don't let the world's influences taint how you live. And he's saying it's the tongue that now stains the whole body. So we take these ideas that originate with Satan, stain, the staining wickedness of the world, and they spread like wildfire to every part of our lives. Not just every part of our lives and every part of our body, but every aspect of life. The entire course of life here means from, from the, the moment you are born to the time you die. The, the tongue impacts every millisecond of that time. And James is saying, this is, this is far worse than you thought. Right? That's not what you want a doctor to say to you. You go in, man, my, my ankles bother me. Actually, the doctor comes in, we ran the test, and this is... This is far worse than we thought. This is much more horrific than we imagined. <laughs> Great. Right, so this all kind of boils down to, in verse 6, it is set on fire by hell. So set on fire here is, is continuous. This is continually set on fire by hell. The word hell here is Gehenna. It's used 12 times in the New Testament. 11 of them from the mouth of Jesus himself. So Gehenna is this, this image of the valley of Hinnom, just outside of Jerusalem. And in Old Testament times, you can read about this. Um, there were two main false gods in the Old Testament, Molech and Baal. And one of the things they demanded was child sacrifice. And they would do that in this valley, the valley of Hinnom. Eventually, that was, that was ceased, and it became kind of this... this trash pit, just a dump, and they set it on fire to, to burn it up. And so, so you have tied in this image of hell here, this valley of Hinnom, of idolatry, sacrifice, death, murder, garbage, wreckage. It's on fire, this, this smoke that never ends. And James is saying that our our lives are set on fire. The entire course of life is set on fire from our tongue, which is set on fire by this, this image of hell itself. Horrible imagery. So it is far worse than we thought. In Galatians 5, Paul lists the fruit of the Spirit, 
You remember these? You know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. James is saying there's another kind of fruit, this diseased fruit that we've kind of seen in some respect as we've navigated our way through James. But tied to the tongue, he would say, here's some diseased fruit of your tongue. Belittling, blasphemy, boasting, criticism, dishonesty, flattery, gossip, sarcasm, slander. All of these things come from our tongues, this world of unrighteousness. Everything that we, we see in the world originates in the tongue, which James eventually says, yeah, originates in our hearts. It is why Isaiah says, we saw this at the beginning of the year, these seven prayers for, for the church. Isaiah 6, right? as, as Isaiah is confronted with the holiness of God, his first response is, woe unto me. I'm undone. I'm ruined because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I, I live among a people of unclean lips. That's what the, the weight of everything that James is saying here, Isaiah knew. In 1899, four newspapers, uh, reporters, their main reporters for these uh, newspapers met at a train station in Denver. There were not a lot of news, and so uh, they were sent out to go find some news. What can we report on? So these guys met all with the same task. And so they went to a bar and kind of fabricated a story. And as the night progressed, the story got juicier and bigger and, uh, and better. And said, you know, what, what country should we focus on? Should we focus on Russia? No, not Russia. Should we focus on something in Europe or Africa? No, let's focus on China. It's a little less, less easy for them to validate. So, well, what about China? How about the Great Wall of China? Right? So there's something going on. Maybe we'll, we'll tell them that, that China, in a means of trying to open themselves up to trade, they're going to tear down, they're going to rip down the Great Wall of China. Right? So they, as the night went on, they progressed. They came up with all these details. Next day, went back, published these stories. And within a couple of days, every major newspaper in America had run this. You know, China's going to tear down the Great Wall. Well, eventually China found out, and those loyal to China found out and thought, sounds like America is going to send people in to tear down the Great Wall. And so about 12,000 troops from all the surrounding countries came to defend China. And during that time, about 250 missionaries that had been in China were all taken by the Chinese government and killed. It's called the Boxer Rebellion. And it started with four guys in a bar trying to fabricate something so they could increase readership. How great a world of fire is set by you know, this world of unrighteousness by, by just these simple words. 250 missionaries killed. Remember growing up, going camping, and you'd always see Smokey the Bear or it's kind of a forgotten or a bygone image. Only you can prevent forest fires. Remember this? You go into the Black Hills and you see Smokey standing there. Only you can prevent forest fires. And James is saying, no, you can't. No, you, you can't. It's impossible for you to do this on your own. Look at verse 8. No human being can tame the tongue. And all of this unrighteousness that comes with it, no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. And we hear that and think, well, great, I've got an out. Right? We, we hear that and go, well, that's kind of bad news. It's impossible for me to control my tongue. But, but embedded in this bad news is tremendous good news. Listen to what James is saying. All of these things set on fire by hell, we can tame every kind of creature that we can see at the zoo and in nature. It's impossible. No Human being can tame the tongue. It's impossible for you. But it doesn't mean that it's impossible completely. What it means is James is driving us here toward Christ. We can control anything and everything but our tongue. In other words, the tongue needs a new master. The tongue needs something greater to, to tame it than, than we are possibly able on our own to do. 
St. Augustine said, when it is tamed, talking about the tongue, when it's tamed, we confess that this is brought about by the pity, the help, and the grace of God. I long to, to be holy in what I say. Like, I go through this list of diseased fruit of belittling and blasphemy and boasting and criticism and go, man, that is my life. And James is saying, it's impossible for you to tame. It's not impossible for Christ. And then we, so as we look at commands, again, we've said this before, do and, and don't come after done. So we have to see how has Christ fulfilled this for us? I love these this picture on the right, right? Most of the, the images that we have of Jesus, these paintings that have been done, are the one on the left. This stoic, like I have an s- upset stomach and I'm frustrated with Peter. Like just hurry up with the picture. Let me, let me be done. Right? This, this picture on the right is from a Korean artist. It's, it, it captures, there's only a handful of, of pictures that people have painted that Jesus is laughing I know my, my own heart, and when jokes are being told, it piques my interest. What are they talking about? And how often there's just a little bit of crassness, a little bit of inappropriateness to them. Like, I, I long for the day. Like, I, I think of Jesus with his disciples and, and laughing with them and just holy humor. I mean, just to, to laugh at each other. With no guile, with no belittling, with no sarcasm. I love sarcasm, but, but it's not a spiritual gift. We tend to think in terms, like, God has blessed me with the gift of sarcasm. No. No. It, it, it's set on fire by hell. But I love this picture because it reminds me that Jesus lived perfectly in my place. Right? Never belittling, never sarcastic that's rooted in sin, right? Never boasting and critical or dishonest and never gossiping and slanderous. Was he angry at times? You bet he was. But, but to be reminded that Christ lived perfectly for me. So when James says, it's impossible for you to tame your tongue, but Jesus lived perfectly in our place. Every word that he uttered, perfectly. And so James is saying, you can't tame it, but, but Christ can. Christ has. And so it's his record of, of perfect obedience for us that, that gains us acceptance with, with God. And so because of that, we have grace to face our sin. The, the words that we utter, the thoughts that we have, all of these things that we're talking about here, grace to face our sin and strength then to turn from it. Thomas Chalmers wrote kind of in the the early part of the 19th century. One of the things, he's not known for much, but one of the things that he is most known for is one sermon that he preached. And most people that quote the sermon or the sermon title have never even listened to the sermon. But his sermon title alone is fantastic. It's called The Expulsive Power of a New Affection. So he kind of walks through sin and says the only way that you can displace the sin in your life Right, this, the powerful affections that we have for sin is by replacing it with something far greater, far more beautiful, far more captivating for us. So the report for, from James here of our inability is that we need help, and, and he's pointing us to the gospel and saying, Christ has done this for us. And the only way for us to battle this sin of our tongue is this expulsive power of a new affection, of seeing Christ's sacrifice for us. The last thing we see in this text is that our tongues reveal our inconsistencies. So if we've seen the reality and the report, now it's the remedy. Verses 9 to 12. With it, with the tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing My brothers, these things ought not be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grape vine produce figs? The answer is no. Then he says, neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. So the remedy here is to to live consistently, 
to live according to the new nature that's been implanted in us. So again, James is picking up on this theme that he brought up in in chapter 1, verse 8, this this double-minded man, unstable in all that he does. So it's impossible for us to live between two worlds at the same time. So the tongue, from the tongue come beauty and destruction. From the, from the same tongue come loveliness and atrocity. Right? Listen to music. Watch movies. Read poetry. Right? And, and both of them, to, to either ex, extreme, are both of these things. And so James is saying it, we can't live both ways at the same time. It's an inconsistent, it's, it's impossible for us. And one of the key points that he makes and then gets frustrated, and he gets angry here at the end of verse 10, is when we bless God with our mouth and then turn and we curse somebody made in his image. Notice he doesn't say somebody made in our image, right? Because then it's easy to, to, to figure out who's worthy and who's not. You look like me, you dress like me, you talk like me, you're in. And James is saying, no, not your image, the image of God which includes everyone on the face of the planet throughout human history, we, we shouldn't bless God and then curse them. He's saying it's not supposed to be this way. Don't do it. Again, he's, this is the only time in the New Testament we see this kind of language, and so commentators aren't sure like, exactly what he's saying, but he's, he's frustrated here that this is not the way it's supposed to be. So this Jekyll and Hyde kind of living saying, your life has a purpose, right? Most things you buy now, like just so that the, the company that makes it and manufactures it can't be sued, they put something on there like use only as directed, right? James is saying, your life has a purpose. Use as directed. His call here is to remind us of our identities, calling us to live in light of who we really are. John 7, Jesus says, if anyone thirsts, it's a great verse, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So there's something beautiful about us coming to faith and this now, this this spring within us that bubbles over of of satisfying water, of living water that now blesses other people, that quenches their thirst. And James is saying, look, the activity of your life must match the activity of your heart. And this is the pattern all over the Bible, that what goes into your mouth is of little concern. Right? It's what comes out of our mouth that condemns us. James is saying, consistently glorify God with every single word that you speak. To him and to those made in his image. Bear fruit that matches your life. Live consistently by the words that we utter. I used to have a t-shirt years ago. I don't know what happened to it, actually. It just says, blue shirt, yellow writing. They will know we are Christians by our t-shirts. Just to see the sarcasm. Love that shirt because we, we live that way. That people will just know because of this T-shirt, not because of how I live, not because of how I speak, not because of the outworking and the outflow of my life, but simply because of a bumper sticker and the coffee mug and the T-shirt. James is saying, Man, live in such a way that what God has done for you in your heart, of giving you a new heart, of of not counting your sin against you. Live in such a way that everyone around you knows that. The world is watching. More importantly, the world is listening. And when the church or Christians sound the same as everything they already hear, their ears just simply tune out. Again, the context of James is this dispersed group of Christians all over the Mediterranean world living amongst people that don't really care for them. And he's saying, in some sense, then don't respond the same way they do. Don't live the same way that they do. You must respond differently. So speak in such a way that you portray that the living water from here in John 7 
has so quenched your own heart, it has so satisfied your own soul that you can't help but extinguish these fires that James is talking about. So this water dumps on these flames, it puts them out, and at the same time, it will quench the thirst of those parched by the things offered by this world. That the world knows, right? You know, prior to coming to Christ, just the, the dissatisfaction, not the, the longing of your heart that nothing could satisfy. And then Jesus says, come to me if you're thirsty. I'll quench your thirst. So how's your tongue this morning? Does it reveal your inadequacies, your inabilities, your inconsistencies? I trust that it does. I hope that it does. As you evaluate your life, that it, like James's goal here of pressing us toward Christ, just going, you can't tame it. But but Christ has and Christ does, and by the hope that we have in him, we can live lives that honor God. But for you, it, it may be gossip or nagging. Or with your spouse or at work. Maybe lying or boasting about school. Like you want the approval of others so bad that you'll say anything to be accepted. You build others up by, or build yourself up by by cutting others down. Maybe starting rumors at work or division in your family or destruction in the community. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the quickest way for us to display the true state of our faith and at the same time remind us of our greatest need is to simply open your mouth. And I trust that as you do, it will drive you toward Christ. I invite the worship team to come for a closing song. Use this time to, to just reflect on, on God's word. My brothers, these things ought not be so. Let me pray for us and of a closing song. God, it is our inadequacies and our inabilities and our inconsistencies that, that drive us to the only place that we need to go, namely the cross, where you are both just and justifier in punishing sin and forgiving us. So give us grace as we sing and as we hear your word, to live in, in, in light of that, to live obediently because of it. We pray in Jesus' great name. Amen. Please stand for the closing song.
before our benediction, a couple weeks ago I said that you know, as we neared James 5 and just this call, if any of you sick, you know, to call the elders and have them pray and anoint you with oil, um, that, that we wanted to make that available, not just then, but, but now. And so that invitation is, is on the table for whenever you need that. That's a great privilege and honor for us as elders and pastors to do that. And with that in mind, I would invite you to stick around after service. The, the Lowe's have asked us to do that this morning and invited you to stay if you'd like. So we're just going to gather in the fireside room and pray uh, for Andrew and, uh, and do what James 5 calls us to. So our benediction, Isaiah 6, verses 5 to 7. And Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I am lost For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraph flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal. And he had taken with tongues from the altar, and he has touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Your sin, by faith, has been atoned for. So now live this week in light of that reality seeking to honor God and others in how you live. You're dismissed. We'll see you next week.